Chapter 2 Devil's Deceptions and Back Rubs Because Allah afflicted Eve, all the women of the world menstruate, and they are stupid. You may be wondering why Muhammad based his new religion on old Bible stories and why he found it necessary to alter them. Muslim scholars insist that the characters and events, at least up to the point of departure, are similar because Yahweh and Allah are the same God. Unfortunately, that makes less sense than the sun falling out of a chariot and angelic wings blotting out the moon. If Allah is Yahweh, simply translate the Old Covenant into Arabic and be done with it. We have proved that the Bible was not changed with the passage of time, so if it was divinely inspired as Muhammad claims, it still must be true. But as we discovered in the last chapter, Muhammad was allergic to the truth. Apparently it didn't serve his interest. It's hard to imagine a man speaking more ignorantly or lying more transparently. The fact that Muslims are wholly reliant on his testimony for the entirety of their religion and the very existence of their God puts them in a precarious position. Islam is on life support and we haven't even left paradise yet. Thus far, the Quran and Hadith have demonstrated that Muhammad wasn't very smart and that his God wasn't any help. That should be evident by now. So lacking creativity and inspiration, Muhammad turned to the best documented, best known, monotheistic religion, Judaism, to make his personal quest seem religious. So far, so good. Team Islam usurped Jewish ideas, terms, names, characters, and events. Muhammad penciled himself in as a fellow prophet. As the lead act on the marquee, he cast Allah in the role of Yahweh. He replaced Jews with Arabs and started telling Bible stories. But being illiterate, or stupid, he got them all fouled up. The Jews laughed themselves silly. Rather than accepting the self-promoting prophet, they teased him for his errant portrayals of their history. But aspiring tyrants never admit to being wrong. Rather than correct his revisionist history, Muhammad claimed supremacy. He said, if you reject my message, you will die. Emboldened by the militants, he came to a command. He twisted the stories further in an effort to make his wanton behavior look prophetic. Biblical accounts were contorted to the point they became nonsensical in the context of the time and place they actually occurred. The Jews, in defense of their scriptures, mocked Muhammad all the more. Enraged, Allah's messenger struck back, calling them donkeys, apes, and pigs. He ordered his followers to kill every Jew. He showed them who was right and who was wrong. He'd prove who was godly and who was not. When you view this continuing saga in that light, and from this perspective, even stories of a talking sun that wears clothing and sets in a muddy spring, surrounded by extraterrestrials, becomes relevant. And if there's a better excuse, I mean explanation for this malarkey, I mean an alternative view, I'd love to hear it. For if there is something in Islam that makes sense, something that was actually divine, we might use it to reach Muslims, reason with them, and keep them from killing us. By way of confession, I came to see the Bible as the inspired word of Yahweh because of the prophecies it contained. I recognized that it was impossible for a 2,000 to 4,000 year old book to accurately foretell today's events if it were not authored by a spirit who existed outside of time. You do not have to share my view, however, to understand that Islam disproved itself when it agreed with my conclusion. Two inspired books from the same deity cannot be contradictory to the point of being opposites. Muhammad's dependence on the Bible requires us to compare his text with the original. To understand Islam, we must determine why they are so different. I believe the answer is obvious. Yahweh's spirit authored one, and Satan inspired the other. Once again, you do not need to agree with me. You may view Muhammad's demonic behavior and the motivation for his deceitful scriptures metaphorically. His demons can be seen as our guttural nature, human depravity in full bloom. It doesn't require a devil to seduce covetous men into deceiving others to gain power, sex, and money. 
Now for another confession. Any attempt to reorganize Islam chronologically is perilous. The religion was founded upon the claim that Abraham had a religion, that he built the Kaaba and established Islamic rituals. With most of his Quran pilfered from the Torah, or Talmud, Muhammad professed that Adam, Noah, Abraham, Lot, Moses, and Esau, the Islamic Jesus, were Muslim prophets, setting the stage for Islam long before he was born. The longer Muhammad lived, the more he twisted their stories, making them his own. So if I present the evidence in the order Muhammad actually made his assertions, we'd have to jump in and out of history. But if we use a historical timeline, the Islamic version of creation through the twisting of the patriarch, the immorality of Mecca, ending with the violence of Medina, we'll have to review the Quranic scriptures and Islamic hadith that were revealed last first. Tabadi and Ishak, as historian and biographer, use the same chronological approach I am using. Thus, every surah we reference early in our narratives was revealed late in Muhammad's mission. Adam and Satan dominate Islam's genesis, yet none of the supporting Quranic verses are from the first score of surahs in the order of their alleged revelation. I share this to keep you from jumping to the conclusion that Muhammad was a well-schooled religious man, professing a sufficient understanding of the Bible to plagiarize it effectively at the outside of his career. In reality, he would not come to know the Torah or Talmud until he came to know the Jews. And he would never come to understand the New Covenant. We pick up the story of Islam's creation account, where we left off, with Iblis, better known as Halal bin Shakar, Satan. I'm going to work the narrative through the Quran, in the seventh surah called, The Wall Between Heaven and Hell. Allah, or I should say Muhammad, corrupts one of the earliest Genesis stories, but he gets sidetracked with intolerance and terrorism before he dives into his version. So in difference to the Islamic apologists, I'll keep the whole passage in context, starting at the beginning. But before we start, however, you should know that the only reason we can read this or any surah is because an angel or a clanging bell dictated it to Muhammad directly from the memorial tablets, written at Allah's command by the pen before the universe was created. Quran 7 verse 1 This book which by implication is the Quran, has been sent down to you. The opening verse is not accurate. The Quran wasn't a book. Based upon the historical record, nothing would be committed to writing or compiled into a book for another century. Do not hesitate to warn the unbelievers through it. This warning was not for the unbelievers' benefit or for their salvation. All non-Muslims are predestined to hell. So the threat of impending punishments, which could not be averted, strongly suggests that the author was either demented or a sadist. Muhammad's schizophrenic spirit said, Quran 7, verse 3, Follow the revelation given to you from your Lord, and follow not as protectors other than him. Third person. Little do you remember my, spoken in first person singular, warning. How many towns have we, now plural, destroyed as arrayed by night. Our punishment took them suddenly while they slept for their afternoon rest. Our terror came to them. Our punishment overtook them. No cry did they utter, but we were wrongdoers. The Islamic God's taste for terror is shocking. It's hard to fathom scripture bragging. How many towns have we destroyed? Or... Our punishment took them suddenly while they slept. What would possess someone to claim this was godly? The Islamic God, by his own admission, is a terrorist. Before we move on, I want to bring your attention to the motivation behind this opening salvo. Muhammad wanted his detractors to know that his God would terrorize anyone who rejected. Those to whom our message was sent that would be Muslims, or those by whom we sent it, that would be Muhammad. It's a warning. If you deny Muhammad, his followers will terrorize you. Quran 7, verse 7. Verily we shall recount their whole story with knowledge, for we were never absent at any time or place. 
Muhammad, speaking on behalf of his spirit, is acknowledging that the stories in the Quran appear plagiarized, but they are not. He protests because his God was omnipresent. He is preparing us for an onslaught of bastardized Hebrew scripture. Those whose scale of good will be heavy will prosper. Those whose scale will be light will find their souls in perdition. That would be hell. For they wrongfully treated our sign. That's the basis of the religion of Islam, good work. The more you do, the heavier the good side of your scale becomes. Unfortunately, all the good deeds in the world can't outweigh predestination. And the best good deed, according to Muhammad, is to die a jihadist terrorizing infidels. One proof from Bukhari's Book of Jihad, chapter 1, number 1204. A man came to Allah's messenger and said, Guide me to such a deed as equals jihad and reward. He said, I do not find such a deed. Bukhari. The prophet said, A single endeavor of fighting in Allah's cause is better than the world and whatever is in it. As we move into the Medina War Surahs, I will share scores of these with you. Returning to the seventh surah, Allah's miffed that men aren't thankful. Quran 7 verse 10. It is we who have placed you, that would be Adam, with authority on earth, and provided you with means for the fulfillment of your life. Small are the thanks that you give, little give you thanks. It is we who created you and gave you shape. Then we ordered the angels to fall and prostrate themselves to Adam, and they fell prostrate, all save Iblis, who was not of those who made prostration. Iblis is Halal bin Shakar, Lucifer, a fallen angel better known as Satan. The Quran says that he was a jinn or demonic spirit. Both the Quran and Bible agree that Halal bin Shakar rebelled against God. According to the Bible, as an angel, Halal was merely a tool. His relationship with Yahweh was like that of a private to a general. Without choice, angels cannot love, and they are incapable of creativity, which may explain why so much of the Quran was plagiarized. Halal's existence was defined by the same terms that gave Islam its name and authority, submit and obey. The Bible says when Halal rebelled, a third of the angels were cast out of heaven and became demons. They lashed out at Yahweh by deceiving man, separating us from God, just as they had been. This all led to the most infamous meal in human history. But I share this biblical perspective, because once again, Muhammad, lacking imagination, plagiarized it, albeit with his own unique embellishments. Quran 7, verse 12. What prevented you, this would be Iblis, Satan, or Halal bin Shakar, from prostrating when I commanded you? He said, I am better than Adam. You created me from fire and him from clay. So Allah said, Get down from this place. It is not for you to be arrogant here. Get out. You are degraded, for you are the meanest of creatures. The request is odd. Yet the Quran never explains why Allah wanted his angels to humble themselves before man. In the Quran, Satan protests, Quran 7 verse 14, Give me a reprieve until the time they are raised, Allah said. You have your reprieve. He, that being Satan, said, Because you have thrown me out, I will lie in wait, lurking in ambush for them on your right path. I will assault them from behind, from their right and left. You will find them ungrateful. Allah said, Get out of here. You are disgraced and expelled. If any follow, I will fill hell with all of you. The Quran has clearly said that Satan is deceptive and that he is going to hell. This is important because from this point on, Allah will claim to be deceitful and we will find him in hell tormenting men. Continuing to steal from Genesis, the Islamic scriptures say, Quran 7 verse 19, We said, Adam, dwell with your wife in the garden, and enjoy, but approach not this tree, or you will run into harm and become wrongdoers. Then Satan began to whisper suggestions to them, bringing openly before their minds all their shame that was hidden from them. He said, Your Lord only forbids you this tree, lest you should become angels, immortal, living forever. In the garden, Adam was immortal. Seducing Adam with a promise of immortality would be like seducing Arabs with a promise of more sand. Besides, why would Adam want to become an angel if the angels were bowing down to him? Quran 7 verse 21. He swore to them that he was their sincere advisor, so by deceit he brought about their fall. 
This is interesting. Muslims claim that there was no fall of man, thus no reason for the Messiah to come and reconcile fallen man back into fellowship with Yahweh. Further, Satan is mimicking Muhammad. The prophet incessantly claimed to be the sincere advisor, yet through deceit he brought men to their knees. When they tasted of the tree, their shame became manifest to them, and they began to sew together leaves, covering their bodies. Allah called, Did I not forbid you that tree, and tell you that Satan was an avowed enemy? For those who are curious, Tabari. Scholars of the nation of our prophets say, The tree which Allah forbade Adam and his spouse to eat was wheat. Yes, it says a wheat tree. Quran 7, verse 23. They said, Allah, we have wronged our souls. If you do not forgive us, we shall be of the lost losers. Allah said, Go down from here as enemies of each other. Allah seems to think that the Garden of Eden, a.k.a. the Garden of Bliss, is in heaven. Thus, when Adam rejected Allah, he was sent down and not cast out. Also, did you notice the line, You will be enemies of each other. He was speaking of Adam and Chaba, who has been misnamed Eve, foreshadowing the Islamic view of women. Allah continued, On earth will be your dwelling place, and your means of livelihood for a time. He, that would be third person singular, said, Therein you shall live, and therein you shall die, and from it you shall be raised. O children of Adam, we, first person plural now, have sent clothing down to you to cover your shame, and for beauty and clothing that guards against evil. This is of the communications of Allah. Now, third person singular, why do they need clothes to guard against evil? If their lust carried them away, who were they going to be adulterous with? If their lust carried them away, who were they going to be adulterous with? An interesting sidebar on the first kids comes to us in this tradition. Tabari. When Eve became heavy with her first pregnancy, Satan came to her before she gave birth and said, Eve, what is that in your womb? She said, I do not know. He asked, Where will it come out from, your nose, your eye, or your ear? She replied, I do not know. He said, Don't you think, if it comes out healthy, you should obey me in whatever I command you? When she said, Yes, he said, Name him Abd al-Harith Iblis, slave to the cursed. She agreed. Believable dialogue, don't you think? Just the kind of foundation you'd expect to underpin a great religion. Adam said to him, that would be Iblis or Lucifer, I obeyed you once before, and you caused me to be driven out of paradise. So he refused to obey him, and called the child Abd ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman was the name of Muhammad's first god. The 55th surah, named in Ar-Rahman's honor, begins, Ar-Rahman bestowed the Quran, created man, and taught him to express clearly. The sun and the moon revolved to his computation and the grasses and the trees bow to him in adoration. He created man. With multiple gods, Islam became pagan monotheism. An interesting insight here is that our Rahman root is actually identical to the name of the Persian devil. So Abd ar Rahman is indeed identical to the name that Lucifer himself encouraged Eve to bequeath upon her child. And with multiple truth, Islam is flawed revelation. Tabari. They ate from it, and as a result, their secret parts that had been concealed became apparent. But if that's true, how did they get kids? And why does the Islamic tradition say? Tabari. It was the cover of fingernail that had kept their secret parts concealed. Quran 7, 27. O oh, you children of Adam, let not Satan seduce you in the same manner as he got your parents out of the garden making them disrobe, stripping them of their clothing to expose their shame. Somebody is confused. Just six verses earlier, Adam was nude, sinned, and thus felt the need for clothing. He made his own, sewing leaves together. Then Allah sent down supernatural clothes from Walmart. Now they're told that Satan stripped them. For he, that would be Satan or Lucifer, and his tribe of demons or jinn, watched you from a position where you cannot see them. We made the jinn friends of the unbelievers. So there you have it. Satan, Iblis, and jinn are all cut out of the same cloth, all made of fire and from the same tribe. 
These invisible evil spirits or demons lurk in the shadows ready to abuse men, deceiving them. Yet, as you shall discover in one of the most bizarre Quranic passages, these pesky demons think Muhammad and Allah are swell, calling them prophet and lord. They are employed to authenticate the Quran. Quran 7 verse 30 Some he has guided, and for others error is their due. They deserve loss in that they took the devils instead of Allah for their friends, and they think that they are rightly guided. Verse 35. Children of Adam, whenever messengers come from among you, rehearsing my... This would now be singular. ...signs and revelations to you, act rightly so that you have no fear, no reason to grieve. But those who reject our... Now, plural. Signs and scorn them with arrogance. Are they inmates of the fire forever? What messengers? What revelations? Allah is allegedly talking with Adam's kids. The first prophet in scripture wouldn't arrive for over 2,000 years. The Islamic God had no concept of time. Worse, he couldn't even keep himself together, talking in first person singular and plural in the same verse. Somebody was very confused. The second part of this passage is revealing. As we dig deeper into the Quran, you'll find the most repeated theme is, Reject Muhammad and your toast. Although he tries a number of variants, his favorite twist, Bible stories, as he has done here, Muhammad was referring to himself when he warned Adam's kids not to reject the messenger among them. Quran 7, verse 37. Who is more unjust, one who invents a lie against Allah, or one who rejects his signs. For such their appointed destiny must reach them from when our messengers of death arrive and take their souls. These guys sound like Hitler's SS. They say, Now where is that to which you cried beside Allah? They will reply, They have left us in the lurch. There were no signs, no miracles, no proofs of any kind to confirm Muhammad's claim of being a prophet or the Quran's claim to being divinely inspired. The repetition of lies like this was just part of Muhammad's warped game. It's standard megalomaniac behavior. Tell a big enough lie, say it often enough, and enough will believe it for you to prevail. Quran 7 verse 38. Allah's messengers of death will say, Enter the fire. Join the company of men and jinn who passed away before you. Every time a fresh group of people or nation enters, they curse those that went into the fire before them. The most recent entrance into hell ask, Lord, they led us astray, so give them a double torment in the fire. He will say, For each there is already a double dose of torment, so taste the punishment. It's stunning to the point of agony that a billion people, through seduction, indoctrination, and compulsion, have been led to believe that these hateful words are God's. Yet, while stunning, it's not baffling. All Muhammad had to do was to convince 50 well-armed fools. While it took him 10 years, it shouldn't have been hard. Mecca was a town of 5,000. All but a handful were illiterate, steeped in pagan superstitions, and already believing in the pagan idol of the Kaaba, the young and the rebellious, the poor and the destitute, were ripe for the picking. Let's pick up the story of Satan and hell from the Hadith. I will be quoting from the history of Al-Tabadi, Creation to the Flood. There was an angelic tribe of jinn, and Iblis belonged to it. Iblis, that would be Satan or Lucifer, was one of the noblest angels and governed the most honored tribe. Whoever among them says, I am a god besides him, he will have hell as his reward from us. That is how we reward the wrongdoers. This will become Quran 21.29. This verse was revealed specifically for Iblis when he said what he said. May Allah curse him, have him stoned. We've just been given a rather interesting clue. The Quran was revealed for Lucifer's benefit. And ask yourself, how is a stone going to curse or punish a spirit? Iblis belonged to a tribal group called Jinn. They were created from the fire of Simun. All of the angels except this tribal group were created from light. The jinn mentioned in the Quran were created from the tongue of a white-hot fire blazing on its side. This would become Quran 55.15. The first to dwell on the earth were jinn. 
They caused corruption on it and shed blood and killed each other. Since demons are spirits, how could they have shed blood and bled? Allah sent Iblis with an army of angels to fight against the jinn. Iblis and the angels with him caused a bloodbath, but his success went to his head. Allah made Lucifer a traitor against his own tribe, which is exactly what happened with Muhammad in Mecca. Tabari. Allah created some creatures and said, Prostrate yourselves before Adam. They replied, We shall not do that. Allah sent a fire to consume them. Four things should be perfectly clear. First, if you don't prostrate yourself, you're scorched. And while that sounds extreme, it's designed to frighten Muslims. Muhammad is quoted in a hadith from Bukhari entitled, Prayer is obligatory, saying, Bukhari, I would order someone to collect firewood and another to lead prayer. Then I would go burn the houses of the men who did not present themselves at the compulsory prayer and prostration. Islam means submission, and the sign of submission is prostration. The mosque, the centerpiece of Islamic control, is derived from the Arabic word for the place of prostration. Second, Satan is a jinn. Third, jinn are bad. And fourth, everybody associated with jinn loves fire, Muhammad and Allah included. I share this because of the impact it has on the most troubling of narratives in the Quran. And those passages, surprisingly enough, don't include the satanic verses in which Muhammad received scripture from Lucifer. They are instead ones in which Satan's jinn are used to endorse the Quran. The first of these demonic interludes begins, like so many others, with a threatening rant before it torments us with nonsense. Quran 46, verse 27. We have destroyed habitations all around you, having explained our signs in different ways to them that they may turn back. Why, then, did the gods they had taken apart from Allah as protectors not come to their aid? In fact, they are strayed away from them. This is weird. Did the other gods stray away from men, making them real? Or did men stray away from the other gods, making the condemnation irrelevant? It was all a lie what they had contrived. After enduring a litany of Muhammad's whoppers, this is quite a claim, but nothing compared to this. Quran 46, verse 29. Remember when we turned a company of jinn toward you and listened to the Quran? They arrived when it was being recited, and they said, Keep silent. When it was over, they came back to their tribe, warning them, O oh, our people, fellow demonic jinn, we have listened to a book which has come down after Moses, confirming what was sent down before it, showing the way of truth and a path that is straight. The jinn are endorsing the Quran as being truthful, a straight path. That's like Churchill asking Nazis to confirm his policies. Can you imagine a god so desperate he'd solicit demonic assistance? The good housekeeping seal of approval of this is not. And it didn't stop there. The demons went on to say, Quran 46, verse 31, Jinn, listen to, that would be Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, and believe in him so that he may forgive you for your sins and save you from a painful doom. Satan's demonic spirits just proclaimed that Muhammad was their savior and their messenger. Either Muhammad's Quran recital was so convicting it saved devils, or the devils are deceiving men by claiming his lie is true. You make the call. Back in paradise, the prophet's companions explain, Tabari. Iblis was cursed, and Adam settled in. Adam used to go about all alone, not having a spouse to dwell with. He fell asleep, and when he woke up, he found sitting at his head a woman who had been created by Allah from his rib. I know you've heard this before, but so had Muhammad. He asked her what she was, and she replied, A woman. He asked for what purpose she had been created, and she replied, For you to dwell with me. The angels, looking to find out the extent of Adam's knowledge, asked him her name. He replied, Eve, because she was created from a living thing. And Allah said, Adam, dwell in paradise. Eat freely of its plenty wherever you wish. The omission of God's warning not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil may not have been left out of this account by accident. In Islam there is no choice, and therefore no reason for the tree. 
while it exists in other variations, it serves no purpose. Man is predestined to his fate. The reason for the tree in Genesis is to provide Adam with a choice. It is the same choice we must all make, love God or reject him. Love cannot be compelled. Even God cannot require love. A tradition reveals, He then cast slumber upon Adam, as we have heard from the people of the Torah, among the people of the book. I'm told that confession is good for the soul. At least they had the good sense and common courtesy to say where Muhammad stole his material. Tabari, Iblis wanted to meet them in paradise, but the keepers prevented him from entering. He went to a snake, an animal with four feet like a camel. Iblis tried to persuade it to let him enter its mouth and take him to Adam. The snake agreed, passed by the keepers and entered without their knowledge, because that was Allah's plan. If Allah's plan was to help Satan deceive man, you know whose side Allah is on. Iblis talked to Adam from the mouth of the snake, but Adam paid no attention to him. So Iblis said, Adam, may I lead you to the tree of eternity and power that never decays? Both you and Eve will have eternal life and will never die. Since there was no death or dying in paradise, how would Adam know what decay was? How would he be enticed to be eternal when he was created that way? I give you good advice. By tearing their clothes, Iblis wanted to show them their secret parts, which had been concealed from them. From his reading of the books of the angels, he knew what Adam did not, that they had secret parts. Wait a minute. Adam is supposed to be smart and the angels stupid. Now we're told the angels are smart enough to have books, and Adam is oblivious. Tabari. Adam refused to eat, but Eve came forward and ate. Then she said, Eat, Adam. I have had it, and it has done me no harm. But when Adam ate, their secret parts became apparent to them, and they started to cover themselves with leaves of paradise stitched together. This became Quran 7.22. But I don't get it. Why would showing Adam and Eve their private parts seduce them into rebellion? If sex isn't good, why is it the essence of Islamic paradise? As you might expect, there is more than one version of this story. So for some comic relief, let's look to another variant. Tabari. Iblis proposed to the animals on earth that they should take him into paradise so that he could speak with Adam and his spouse, but every animal refused. Finally, he spoke to the snake. It was dressed and walking on four feet, but Allah then undressed it and made it walk on its belly. Conjuring up the image of a dressed snake, walking with a fiery gin in its mouth, on four feet, being undressed by God, takes some doing. Over the next few pages, the man solely responsible for inventing Islam, Allah and the Quran, said... The tree's branches were intertwined, and it bore fruit, which the angels ate to live eternally. Then, Adam went inside the tree to hide, and Eve cut the tree, and it bled. The feather that covered Adam and Eve dropped off. So, now Eve, as you cause the tree to bleed, you will bleed every new moon, and you snake, I will cut off your feet, and you will walk slithering on your face. For giggles... Some camels were originally gin, and it was a tree which made whoever ate from it defecate, but there must be no feces in paradise. Since the angels ate from it to live eternally, where might they have answered the call of nature? For another insight into the mind of Muhammad, and therefore into the character of his God, Tabari, Allah said, It is my obligation to make her bleed once every month as she made this tree bleed. I must also make Eve stupid, although I created her intelligent. Zayed, Muhammad's adopted son, said, In Tabari, Because Allah afflicted Eve, all of the women of the earth menstruate and are stupid. It's a wonder there are any Muslim women. It's a wonder feminist organizations are silent. Why do they tolerate a doctrine that demeans 600 million women? An interesting insight here is also that Eve does not appear in the Old Covenant Scriptures. It's Chaba, which means life-giver. Eve is the name of a pagan goddess. Not being very smart, Muhammad and Allah picked up on the pagan corruption of the sun goddess rather than call Chaba by her scriptural name. Tabari. 
I heard him swear by Allah unequivocally, As long as Adam was in his right mind, he never would have eaten from the tree. Eve gave him wine and got him drunk. She led him to the tree. Muhammad didn't like women very much. That much is obvious. Bukhari. The prophet said, But for the Israelis, meat would not decay. If it were not for Eve, wives would never betray their husbands. He didn't like Jews either. The messenger said, Friday was the Lord of days. On Friday, Adam was created and cast down to the earth. The duration of Adam and Eve's stay in paradise was five hours. As usual, Muhammad had a reason for enduring the criticism these preposterous accounts surely brought him. Friday was important. Muhammad and his followers had previously observed the Jewish Sabbath and prayed facing the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It seemed only natural they had taken everything else from the Jews. But eventually the Jews in Yathrib, today's Medina, mocked the messenger one too many times. So Muhammad decided to differentiate his Islam from the religion of his tormentors. Saturday was theirs. Sunday was taken. So Friday became the Lord of Days. All Muhammad needed was a little justification. What do you suppose happened to Adam once he was deported? The Bible picks up the story in Mesopotamia, where recorded history began, but not Islam. Muhammad had another agenda. Tabari. Allah cast Adam down to earth. The place where he fell down was the land of India. Why India, you ask? Well, because when Adam was cast down there, some of the smell of paradise clung to India's trees. Asia, Muhammad's wife, told us that he said, The things I love most are women and perfume. The prophet was simply trying to excuse his preoccupation with smelling good. If his perfumes were created in paradise, smelling good was religious rather than self-indulgent. Tabari, Adam was cast down in India and Eve in Judah. He went there in search of her, and eventually they were united. Eve drew near him, hence Muzdalifa. They recognized each other, hence Arafat. And they were united in Jam, hence Jam. If the India story was conceived to rationalize the prophet's obsession with perfume, why this elaborate tale? It's all about Muhammad's third and fourth vices power and money. He wanted to legitimize and then control the pagan Hajj. It was the source of the religion's power and wealth during his day. Each of the places Muhammad claims the amorous couple traversed were just outside of Mecca. Going to them was part of the pagan rites he later incorporated into Islam. So he was validating his claim to the religious scam he would soon steal. Tabati was criticized for these stories, so he said, the soundness of this is established by a report serving as conclusive proof that Adam was cast down in India. It is rejected neither by the Muslim scholars nor by the people of the Torah and Gospel. Proof is firmly established by reports from some of them. As you may have seen, justifying the unjustifiable has caused Muslims to latch on to imaginary verifications. There is nothing in the Torah or Gospels that says Adam was dropped in India. The biblical Garden of Eden was on earth, not heaven. It was located near the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in the Black Sea. Tabari it has been mentioned that the summit of the mountain upon which Adam was cast down is one of those closest to heaven. When Adam was cast upon it, his feet were on it while his head was in heaven. He heard the songs of the angels. The angels were afraid of him, so his size was reduced. The Islamic heaven must be very low. Knowing Muhammad, there had to be an ulterior motive. The prophet was trying to rationalize something. What do you suppose it was this time? Tabari. When Allah cast down Adam from paradise, Adam's feet were on the earth while his head was in heaven. He became too familiar with the angels, and they were in awe of him, so much so that they complained to Allah in their various prayers. Allah therefore lowered Adam, but Adam missed what he used to hear from the angels and felt lonely. He complained to Allah and was sent to Mecca. On the way, every place where he set foot became a village, and the interval between his steps became a desert until he reached Mecca. We're getting close. It's important for Muhammad, and thus Islam, to place Adam in Mecca. Could there be more? 
Allah sent down a jewel of paradise where the house, that would be the Kaaba, is located today. Adam continued to circumambulate it until Allah sent down the flood. There you have it. To make the insignificant pagan Kaaba seem godly and important, and to have the stone that represented the most senior idol in the Meccan pantheon appear like it belonged to Islam, we see Allah sending Adam to the Kaaba and giving him his black stone. We even have Adam circumambulate it like a good Muslim for a thousand years, helping to justify Islamic ritual. Muhammad was not only the world's worst prophet, he was the world's most transparent liar. Now all Muhammad needed to do was connect the Kaaba to Abraham so he could rationalize Islam's reliance on the Hebrew Bible. With the Bible snagged, he had himself a religion. Tabari, that jewel was lifted up until Allah sent Abraham to rebuild the house. This is meant by Allah's word, and we established for Abraham the place of the house as residence. This would become Quran 22.26. Muhammad was as predictable as sunrise. In the actual test, there is a re in parentheses before build. In the creation account, Allah built the Kaaba himself. Then it was built by Adam. Now we are told that Abraham built it. So I ask you, how many times should a prophet be allowed to contradict himself before he is no longer considered a prophet? The legends behind the Kaaba are essential to Islam. If they don't make sense, neither does the religion. Tabari. Allah founded the house together with Adam. Adam's head was in heaven while his feet were upon the earth. The angels were afraid, so his size was reduced to 60 cubits, or 30 meters. Adam was sad because he missed the angelic songs. He complained, and Allah said, Adam, I have cast down a house for you to circumambulate, as one circumambulates my throne. Adam came to the house, and he and the prophets after him circumambulated it. In this account, we have the Kaaba being built in heaven, and also being built cooperatively by Adam and Allah. Either way, it's a wonder the Islamic God would take credit for building something so crude and unsightly. Reducing Adam is a fairy tale, as is the desert forming between his strides and villages cropping up in his footsteps. So then, when does the make-believe world of Islam end and the real world begin? When do we move out of fiction and into non-fiction? Stated another way, can you trust a man who is willing to base his religion on stories this far-fetched? If he had to deceive us to make the Kaaba seem worthy of devotion, how could it be? Tabari. When Adam's size was lowered to sixty cubits, he started to say, My lord, I was your protege in your house, having no lord but you to protect me. There I had plenty to eat and could dwell wherever I wanted. But then you cast me down to this holy mountain. There I used to hear the voices of the angels and see them crowd around your throne and enjoy the sweet smell of paradise. Then you cut me off from these things. This is a confession. Muhammad saw himself as Allah's protege, if not Allah himself. He consistently looked for people to protect him. And as an orphan, he was deprived of food. His own tribe became so disgusted with his continual taunts, they made travel difficult for him. He was consumed with the desire to make Allah's house in Mecca both his and important. He indulged in the sweet smell of perfume and repeatedly claimed that he could hear the angels. What's more, his Quran is filled with complaints. Muhammad couldn't even keep his own twisted version of Adam straight. Listen to this excerpt in which the Prophet's indulgences were falsely manifest in Adam. Tabari, he built for himself cities and castles, and populated them and made them prosperous. He also assembled weapons and established a cavalry. At the end of his life, he became a tyrant. He took the name of Adam and said, If someone calls me by any other name, I shall cut off his hand. He married thirty women, and they gave him many offspring. He liked them and promoted them, so that later kings were their offspring. His realm expanded greatly. Muhammad just couldn't help himself. 
He used a twisted caricature of Adam to make his warped existence seem godly. Muslims want us to believe that Adam, like Muhammad, was a warrior, an unbridled libertine, a prophet, and a politician who hated nicknames. Yes, according to Islam, Adam was just like Muhammad. Tabari, Adam and his descendants were prophets with royal authority and rulership on earth. Allah made him a prophet and a messenger to his children. He revealed to Adam 21 scrolls. Adam was taught them by Gabriel, who wrote them down with his own hand. Among the things Allah revealed to Adam was the prohibition against eating dead animals and pork. He also revealed to him the letters of the alphabet on 21 leaves. Writing began with pictures, not letters. And since we know it, how did it escape their God's grasp? Well, that's a detail. There's a bigger issue at stake. Muhammad's absurd and transparent bastardization of biblical characters was essential to establishing his credibility and thus to imposing his religion. Ultimately, exposing Muhammad's motivation for doing so is central to understanding the mess the world is in today. As we continue the story of the Islamic Adam, pay attention to three things. First, the details. Megalomaniacs are so full of themselves they get carried away. They present their preposterous notions as if they were divinely inspired. Second, the worst part of lying is remembering what you said. Most everything Muhammad reveals contradicts something he has or will profess. Third, each tradition invariably devolves into making Muhammad seem prophetic, or Mecca, its Kaaba, and ritual seem divine. Tabari, when Allah saw the nakedness of Adam and Eve, he commanded Adam to slaughter a ram from the eight couple of small cattle he had set down from paradise. Adam took its wool, and Eve spun it. He and Eve wove it. Adam made a coat for himself, and a shift and a veil for Eve. They put on that clothing. Then Allah revealed to Adam, I have a sacred territory around my throne. Go and build a house for me there. This time, the clothes weren't provided by Allah, nor made of leaves. And to spin and weave wool, one has to have a spinning wheel and a loom. Did Eve invent these? And speaking of Eve, in true Islamic fashion, we are led to believe she was made to wear a veil. Adam made it for her, even though they were the only humans on earth. Who was she hiding her face from? Adam said, Lord, how can I build a house? I do not have the strength, and I do not know how. Eve knows how to build a spinning wheel and loom from scratch. Yet Adam can't pile rocks. And Muslims say that God made women stupid. So Allah chose an angel to assist him, and he went with him to Mecca. Tabari. Adam built the house with materials from five mountains, Mount Sinai, the Mount of Olives, Mount Lebanon, and Al-Judi. He constructed its foundation with materials from Mount Hira near Mecca. When he was finished with its construction, the angel went out with him to to Arafat. He showed him all of the rites connected with the pilgrimage that people perform today. Then he went with him to Mecca, and Adam circumambulated the house for a week. Returning to the land of India, he died upon Mount Nud. I bet my life that if archaeologists examined the stones of the Kaaba, they'd find no evidence that they came from any of those faraway places, or that the construction dates to 4000 B.C. But the egregious lie was not without benefit. We have arrived at the motivation behind this fairy tale, the rites and rituals of Islam as they were adapted and ordered by Muhammad. Everything associated with the pilgrimage had pagan origins. Nothing was biblical. Muhammad knew the truth, but he was desperate to give the Hajj a holy spin. His career was dependent upon it, and lest we forget, in our quest to determine his veracity, in this version, Adam returns to India after a week of circumambulation. The last time we played this game, he continued to rotate until the flood. According to the third caliph, Umar... Tabari. While Adam was in India, Allah revealed to him that he should perform the pilgrimage to this house, as in it already existed, and thus it didn't need to be built from the stones of four mountains. Then, eventually he reached the house, he circumambulated it, and performed all of the rites of the pilgrimage. He wanted to return to India, 
When he reached the mountain passes of Arafat, the place of Muhammad's farewell sermon, the angels met him and said, You have performed the pilgrimage faultlessly. This surprised him. When the angels noticed his surprise, they said, Adam, we have performed the pilgrimage to this house 2,000 years before you were created. And Adam felt properly chastised. Okay, so tell me, why did the angels go to Mecca to worship Allah if he lived in heaven? The pages that follow detailed the origins of perfume and fruit. We'll take a pass on them and go directly to things essential to Islam. As you read these words, remember that internal contradiction is one of the surest signs something is false. Muhammad, we are discovering, is the poster boy for this dubious honor. And our boy's nose is about to grow a mile longer. Tabari. The black stone, which was originally whiter than snow, was brought down with Adam as well as the staff of Moses. It was made from the myrtle of paradise, which, like Moses, was ten cubits, or five meters, tall, and also myrrh and incense. Then anvils, mallets, and tongs were revealed to him. When Adam was cast down upon the mountain, he looked at an iron rod growing on the mountain. The first thing of iron he hammered was a long knife, also known as a sword. Then he hammered the oven, the one which Noah inherited, and that boiled with the punishment in India. When Adam fell down, his head brushed against heaven. As a result, he became bald, and passed on baldness to his children. What was a rock doing in paradise? If one could take something, wouldn't they pick an implement more useful than a stone? Yet while that stone was worthless to Adam, it was supremely useful for Muhammad. He turned a Meccan meteorite into the creator god of the universe. But Allah's stone was black. How and why did Snow White turn ugly, Muhammad said. The stone turned black because it was fingered by menstruating women. A few more questions remain. If Moses was five meters tall, over 16 feet, how did he pass himself off as being part of Pharaoh's family? And finally, how could Adam have hit his head against heaven by falling down? Perhaps this is a clue. Muhammad is telling us something about Allah and the location of the Islamic paradise. Why be so picky, you may be wondering. Ancient mythology and pagan religions are full of such nonsense. Yes, but Islam was invented ten centuries after the last pagan myth was conceived. So he is without excuse. More to the point, Muslims are killing us today because of Muhammad's claim. Suicide bombers blast themselves into oblivion based upon this maniac's promises. Simply stated, a prophet who makes a practice of lying shouldn't be trusted. Mohammed's promise of paradise for martyrs who die killing infidels can't be relied upon. Calling this verbal diarrhea a religion doesn't make it one. Right from the beginning, there has been a clear and undeniable pattern of deception and delusion. And it never ends. Mohammed was willing to say and do anything in the name of his spirit so long as it advanced his personal agenda. Muhammad, speaking on behalf of Allah, in an Islamic hadith says, I shall have one of those houses singled out for my generosity and distinguish it from all others by my name and call it my house. I shall have it proclaim my greatness and it is upon it that I have placed my majesty. Allah is bragging about a stubby pile of unhewn and unmortared rocks. His house didn't even have a roof because there was no wood for beams or carpenters in Mecca. My majesty. Indeed. Sounding more like Hinduism than Islam. In addition, I, being in everything and all together with everything, shall make that house a safe sanctuary whose sacredness will extend to those around, those underneath, and those above it. Some safe sanctuary it turned out to be. Muhammad led dozens of armed raids against the Meccans for control of Allah's house. Even today, the Kaaba is the cornerstone of terror. I shall make it the first house 
founded as a blessing for mankind in the valley of Mecca. They will come to it disheveled and covered with dust upon all kinds of emaciated mounts from every ravine, shouting, At your service, shedding copious tears and noisily proclaiming, Allahu Akbar. These are the words Islamic terrorists say before they commit murder. You shall dwell there, Adam, for as long as you live. Then the nations, generations, and prophets of your children shall live there, one nation after the other. Outright deceit is another way to tell if someone is worthy of being the founder of a religion. There is no trace of a permanent settlement in Mecca, much less a nation prior to the 6th century. Depending on whether you believe Moses or Muhammad, Adam left the garden 6,000 to 7,500 years ago. That's a 4,500 year error. The harder Muhammad tries to make Mecca and the Kaaba appear credible and religious, the less credible and religious they appear. He commanded Adam to go up to the sacred house which was cast down to earth for him. What happened to building it and the rocks from the four mountains? And to circumambulate it, just as he used to see the angels circumambulate Allah's throne. The sacred house was a single jewel, I was told. The house was cast down, being a single jewel. Those last two lines confirm something Muslims vociferously deny. A house is a place in which people live. It is unlike a temple, which is a place where people go to worship. Allah's house was a stone. Most pagan gods were thought by their creators to embody the idol that represented them. Allah was no different. Tabari. Eventually, when Allah drowned the people of Noah, he lifted it up, but its foundation remained. Allah established it as a residence for Abraham, who rebuilt its later form. That's where all of this was going all along. Muhammad had to introduce Noah and then connect Mecca and Islam to Abraham. Allah's messenger turns both Noah and Abraham into prophets that are indistinguishable from himself. Allah, we are told, drowned everybody because they mocked Noah's message, just as he will burn those who mock Muhammad's. Then he remade Abraham in his image, as a Muslim who was tormented and tested. These things were needed to justify his reliance on the Bible, and to make himself and the Kaaba appear worthy. Tabari when we were sitting in the mosque, Mujid said, Do you see this? I replied, You mean the stone? He said, You call it a stone? I said, Is it not a stone? He said, I was told by Abdallah bin Abbas that it was a white jewel that Adam took out of paradise to wipe his tears, tears that did not stop for 2,000 years. I said, Why and how did it turn black? He replied, Menstruating women were touching it in the Ja'ilia, the time of ignorance. Muhammad valued Allah's stone as much as he despised menstruating women. His faithful managed to tie these things together. <laughs> What you're going to hear next is one of the most diabolical doctrines of Islam. Men and women are born to be tormented. They had no choice in the matter. Eternal damnation is God's doing, not ours. Tabari. Then Allah rubbed Adam's back and brought forth his progeny, and every living being to be created by Allah to the day of resurrection came forth at Naman. He scattered them in front of him like tiny ants. He made covenants with them. He took two handfuls and said to those on the right, Enter paradise. And he said to the others, Enter fire. I do not care. A loving and merciful God, if there ever was one. But beyond demented, this is further evidence that Allah and Yahweh are opposites. Yahweh wants us to choose to love him. Allah chose for us, and he doesn't care much less love. A moment's reflection on this doctrine renders an undeniable verdict. Islam is irrelevant. If all men and women are predestined to heaven or hell, faith is folly. Good works are no more valuable than bad ones. Rituals are ridiculous. Martyrdom is madness. Eat, drink, and be merry for a back rub sealed our fate. Tabari. 
The messenger said, Allah created Adam, and then rubbed Adam's back with his right hand, and brought forth his progeny. Then he said, I have created these as the inhabitants of paradise. Then he rubbed his back with his left hand, and said, I have created those for the fire, and they will act as the inhabitants of the fire. A man asked, O oh, messenger, how is that? Muhammad replied, when Allah creates a human being for paradise, he employs him to act as the inhabitants of paradise, and he will enter paradise. And when Allah creates a human being for the fire, he will employ him to act as the inhabitants of the fire, and will thus make him enter the fire. In other words, he didn't have a clue. Although he gives us a clue as to what he is like, a peek into his soul, into his religion, and his deity. His God directs the actions of men, good and bad. If you are to believe Muhammad, Allah is the employer of evil, and that's not good. Worse, he directs men to act badly, so that he can punish them for acting as he decreed. Islam confirmed this fatalistic right and left hand stuff in a Bukhari hadith, and then again in the Quran's 56th surah. Bukhari Every created soul has its place written for him, either in paradise or in the hell fire. His happy or miserable fate is predetermined for him. The Quran says in 56, 8, Those of the right hand, how happy will be those of the right hand. Those of the left hand, how unhappy will be those of the left hand. Who will be honored in the garden of bliss, a number of the earlier peoples, and a few of the later ages, on couches wrought of gold, reclining face to face, youth of never-ending bloom, those are the Islamic perpetual virgins, will pass round, cups and decanters full of sparkling wine, they shall not be affected with headache thereby, nor shall they get exhausted. Sounds like Allah's Viagra. And such fruits as they fancy, bird meats that they relish, and companions pure and beautiful with big eyes like pearls within their shells as a reward. A drunken orgy is the reward for being a right-hander. It's no wonder they find boys willing to die for the cause. Quran 56 verse 33 Unending and forbidden exalted beds and maidens incomparable. We have formed them in a distinctive fashion and made them virgins, loving companions matched in age, for the sake of those of the right hand. This view of paradise is so vulgar, demeaning, sexist, and immoral, I find it repulsive. The next time you hear a Muslim say that the God of the Quran and the God of the Bible are the same, remind them of their God's idea of a good time. The next time you hear Muslims condemn the West for its sexual decadence and perversion, ask them to read their Quran. This is the fate the sadistic God of Islam selected and then predestined for the lefties. Quran 56, verse 41. But those of the left hand, how unhappy those of the left hand! They will be in the scorching hot wind and boiling water, under the shadow of thick black smoke neither cool nor agreeable. They will be gathered together on a certain day, which, like their fate, is predetermined. Then you, the erring and the deniers, will eat zakum. It's a thorn tree. Fill your bellies with it and drink scalding water, lapping it up like female camels, raging of thirst and diseased. Such will be their entertainment, their welcome on the day of doom the welcome of boiling water, and the entertainment of roasting in hell. This is indeed the ultimate truth. According to the ultimate truth, only one in a thousand people will avoid the entertainment of roasting while lapping up thorns and scalding water. Allah is fixated on tormenting his creation. He speaks of pain and punishment more frequently than any other subject, a thousand times in the Quran. And if God thinks this is entertaining, we've got a problem. Fortunately for mankind, Allah isn't God. He's just a warped figment of Muhammad's sadistic imagination. And while that's good, it's also bad. Over a billion people claim to be subservient to Allah. Sixty percent are young, and many of them are willing to die for their virginal reward. The story of Adam's boys is next. 
What do you bet Muhammad twists this Bible account for his benefit? Tabari. The story of Cain and Abel was told by Allah to Muhammad in the Quran, saying, Recite to them the meaning of the people of the book, the story of the two sons of Adam, truthfully, to the end of the story. So here we go. Eventually, two boys, called Cain and Abel, were born to Adam. Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a herdsman. Cain was the older of the two. Thus far, this is from the Bible. But there is an Islamic twist. Cain had a sister who was more beautiful than Abel's sister. How could that be if they were brothers? Abel sought to marry Cain's sister, but Cain refused and said, She is my sister, born together with me, and she is more beautiful than your sister. I deserve to marry her more than you do. Adam ordered Cain to marry her to Abel. However, he refused. Muhammad's preoccupation with sex was second only to his sadism, and Islam's prophet, like his version of Abel, murdered and indulged in incest to satisfy his cravings. Muhammad married his son's wife simply because she was more beautiful than any of his. Cain and Abel offered a sacrifice to Allah to find out who was more deserving of the girl. On that day, Adam was absent as he had gone to have a look at Mecca. Allah had said to Adam, Adam, do you not know that I have a house on earth? Adam replied, Indeed, I do not. Allah said, I have a house in Mecca, so go there. In Islam, one thing is eternal, contradictions. Just a few pages ago, Adam was created with building the Kaaba. Adam said to heaven, Guard my two children. I thought he had four kids, two sons and two daughters. Don't daughters count? But heaven refused. Adam addressed the earth with the same request, but the earth refused. Excuse me. In Islam, two things are eternal, contradictions and foolishness. He addressed the mountains, but they also refused. Then he spoke to Cain, who said, Yes, you shall go, and when you return, you shall be happy with the condition you find your family. After some bragging and bickering, we find, Abel offered a fat young sheep, and Cain offered a sheaf of corn. Finding a large ear, Cain husked and ate it. A fire came down from heaven. It consumed Abel's offering and left that of Cain. Whereupon Cain got angry and said, I shall kill you to prevent you from marrying my sister. Abel said, Allah accepts only from those who... Love? No, sorry. Guess again. Fear him. One day Cain came upon him while he was asleep. He lifted a big rock and crushed Abel's head with it. Islamic perversion continues. Allah sent two ravens that were brothers, and they fought with one another. When one killed the other, it dug a hole for it and covered it with soil. When Cain saw that, he said, Woe to me, I am incapable of being like that raven, so as to conceal my brother. Woe to me, am I incapable of being like that raven, so as to conceal my brother? This explains Allah's word, and Allah sent a raven to scratch a hole in the earth in order to show him how to conceal his brother. This would become Quran 531. Allah's idea of dealing with guilt is to hide the evidence. I want to let you in on a little secret. These fanciful tales didn't come from Allah or even Muhammad's vivid imagination. They were pilfered from the Jewish Talmud, an uninspired collection of myths and fables. With that in mind, let's spend a moment in the fifth surah. After a dialogue between Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness, the scene jumps abruptly 2,000 years back in time. Verse 27, And relate to them the story of the two sons of Adam, with truth, when they both offered an offering, but it was accepted from one and was not accepted from the other. He said, I will most certainly slay you. The other said, Allah only accepts from those who fear. Surely I fear Allah. Surely I wish that you should bear the sin committed against me and your own sin, so that you would be one of the inmates of the hell fire, and this is the recompense of the unjust. The hadith we just listened to was designed to give the Quran the context it otherwise lacks. It explained the nature of the beef, or lamb as the case may be. So you may have noticed that Abel is meaner in the Quran than he was in the Hadith. Like Muhammad, he condemned his brother to the hellfire. 
So the Quranic Cain and Muhammad have a great deal in common. Quran 5, verse 30. His mind facilitated to him the slaying of his brother, so he slew him. Then he became one of the losers. Then Allah sent a crow digging up the earth so that he might show him how he should cover the dead body. He said, Woe to me! Do I lack the strength that I should be like this crow and cover the body of my brother? So he became of those who regret. You will find a comprehensive analysis of this passage and others borrowed from the Jews beginning on page 51 of the source material appendix. The Quran abruptly transitions from crow behavior to a justification from genocide. Quran 5 verse 32. For this reason did we prescribe to the children of Israel that whoever slays a soul, unless it be for manslaughter or for mischief in the land, as it is thought he slew all men, our apostles came to them with clear arguments, but even after that many of them certainly act extravagantly in the land. Not only is the causal link unintelligible, the moral lesson is insane. Allah is saying that it's okay to kill Jews if they're causing mischief such as tormenting the prophet by scoffing at him. Allah is thus giving Muhammad a carte blanche for mass murder. And he took it. Muhammad slaughtered thousands of Jews in genocidal rage. This chilling verse exposes the real Muhammad. Quran 5, verse 33. The punishment for those who wage war against Allah and his prophet and strive to make mischief in the land is only this that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous punishment. They would like to escape from the hell fire, but they will never succeed, and their suffering shall be eternal. He punishes whom he wills. Stunning, isn't it? Throughout this creation account, Mohammed has professed to being an expert on Lucifer. So I'd like to share some of my favorite satanic hadith. Bukhari, a person slept in and missed the morning prayer. So the prophet said, Satan urinated in his ears. Satan wouldn't be troubled by a Muslim missing a prayer to Allah unless Islam served his interests. Bukhari, Allah's apostles said, when the upper edge of the sun appears in the morning, don't perform a prayer until it has risen. When the lower edge of the sun sets, don't perform a prayer till it has set. For the sun rises between the two sides of Satan's head. Bukhari. The prophet said, yawning is from Satan, and if any one of you yawns, he should check his yawning as much as possible. For if any one of you during the act of yawning should say, ha, Satan will laugh at him. Bukhari. Allah's apostle said, A good dream is from Allah, and a bad dream is from Satan. So if any one of you has a bad dream and is afraid, he should spit on his left side, for then it will not harm him. The moral of the story is, sleep on the right side of the bed. Bukhari. The prophet said, If anyone rouses from sleep and performs the ablution, he should wash his nose by putting water in it, and then blow it out thrice, because Satan has stayed in the upper part of his nose all the night. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Bukhari. Allah's apostle said, When you hear the crowing of cocks, seek blessing. Their crowing indicates that they have seen an angel. When you hear the braying of donkeys, seek refuge, for their braying indicates that they have seen Satan. Based upon what we have heard thus far, the Quran and Hadith sound a lot like the brain of donkeys. Do you suppose we have seen Satan in them?